we shall start. Hello, everyone. Good morning in the West Coast and good afternoon in the East Coast. Thank you for taking a break in the middle of the day uh, and joining us, I hope, with a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. My name is Dina Wachtel, and on behalf of all my colleagues here at Canadian Friends of Hebrew University and my co-host, Ayala Davis, we want to welcome you. I also want to give a shout out to Deborah Harris, Jerusalem literary agent, for connecting me with Yaniv. Toda, Deborah. I'm delighted to be welcoming Yaniv Itzkovich to our book club, talking about his debut novel in English translation, The Slaughterman's Daughter, translated from Hebrew by Or Sharf. The name of the novel in Hebrew, for those of you who would like to read it in Hebrew, is Tikun Achar Chatzot. Yaniv Itzkovich is an author and a lecturer in philosophy. He has published three novels and one novella. His third novel, The Slaughterman's Daughter, was published by Keter in August of 2015 and was awarded the Agnon Prize. Itzkovich won the Ramat Gan Prize for Literary Excellence and the People of the Book Foundation Prize and was shortlisted for the Sapir Prize. His book was published in English this year right before the COVID began. Itzkovich has a postdoc in philosophy, taught at Columbia University, and published a book based on his academic work entitled Wittgenstein's Ethical Thought, which is based on the work of the Austrian-British philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. He lives in Tel Aviv with his wife and three daughters. David Grossman said about your book, with boundless imagination and a vibrant style, Yaniv Itzkovich creates a colorful family drama that spins 19th century Russia out of control. A remarkable and evocative read. And I can't agree with it more, Yaniv. Pleasure to have you with us. I want to uh, pass the mic to you virtually and invite all our many participants to write their questions in the chat box at the bottom of your screen and we will incorporate them toward the later part of the hour. Take it away, Yaniv. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, after such an introduction, I can only ruin the, the event, but uh, thanks for setting this up. Uh, thank you, Dina and Ayala and David. So, um, so I'm here to tell you a bit about the book and um, I will start with just a short introduction of, of the plot, of the premise, because I assume that uh, some of you uh, didn't read the book yet. So uh, basically the book is about a very special woman. Her name is Fanny Kaisman, and uh, she sets out to a wild journey. Uh, the year is 1894. We're talking about the end of uh, the 19th century. And she's taking off uh, to a wild journey from a small town called Motel, what we would call a shtetl, to the big city of Minsk. And her goal is to bring back the lost husband of her sister, Mende. Uh, her brother-in-law just left his wife with, uh, with her two children, and he just went to Minsk to do whatever he thought was right for him. And by the way, when I started to do research about uh, this period in time of, of, of the Jewish people and in general, I discovered that uh, this phenomenon was not rare. It was actually quite common for Jewish husbands uh, at this time to just, you know, leave their families and uh, they, ha they had all kinds of uh, options. They could go to uh, what we called in Yiddish the Golden Medina to America to find, uh, you know, fame and fortune. They could go to Palestine if they were more of the adventurous type, or they could go maybe to uh, Odessa and maybe, you know, uh, learn something in the university, which is not, uh, was not a typical thing for an Orthodox Jew uh, at this time. So, uh, funny, I, I, I said about her that she's not a, she's not a regular person, 
uh, not only because she has the courage uh, to go through such a journey, but also because she was the daughter of a very uh, well-known slaughterman uh, in you know, a nearby town. And as a child, she was actually quite attracted to her father's profession. So uh, she learned how to slaughter animals when she was a child. She knew, she, she acquired a tremendous skill to use the knife. And it's important because if a woman is going to do such a journey in the Wild East back then, she needs to know how to protect herself. And uh, as it comes, on the first days of her journey, she is attacked by mobsters and uh, she gets her first opportunity to use the knife. And I will not tell you all of the story, but uh, you can imagine that uh, when the police finds uh, a few bodies on her trail, then there begins a certain investigation, what happened, who is the murderer, and a very special policeman called Piotr Novak, who is also a, a protagonist, a very important character in the book. So he starts to think that maybe there is some kinds of Jewish conspiracy, uh, something that uh, is involved, you know, politics, and then the army is involved. And this small journey of this unique woman just to find the husband of her, of her sister becomes a, a, a real chaos and it thrills and, and reverses and uh, what, what we call in Hebrew, I don't know if you know the word balagan, it creates a huge balagan in the Russian empire. And I will not tell you more because I want you to read the book, but... Um, this is like uh, uh, the premise or the, the summary of the plot. So when I speak about the book, uh, very often uh, I'm getting uh, almost the first question is how come uh, Israeli, you know, in his 40s, uh, an Israeli novelist, you know, I was born in Israel, I was raised in Israel, so how come uh, you came up with the idea to write about the 19th century, the shtetl, you know, and uh, stuff like that? So I have to say that when I started to write the book, um, I, had a, uh, I had a technical reason for why did I start to write the book and, and why uh, I was so attracted to the 19th century. It happened completely by accident, okay? I just bumped into a Jewish newspaper uh, from the 19th century, and I opened this newspaper, and in the end of the newspaper, I saw commercials, like ads, advertisement, and I saw that many of the advertisement were uh, women that co who called for the help of uh, the community to find their lost husbands. And I was amazed by that because I didn't know that it was so uh, such a common phenomena back then, you know, for husbands to leave their wife. And I immediately said to myself, wow, that's a great story. Uh, and uh, since I'm very much uh, uh, interested in the 19th century and my favorite writers are 19th century writers, both from the Russian tradition and from the Jewish tradition, you know, uh, writers like Shalom Alechem and uh, Mendele Mocher Sparim and Bredichevsky and uh, all these authors, they are my favorites. So I said to myself that it's a great opportunity to, uh, to do some investigation and to do some uh, uh, research about Jewish life uh, at the end of the 19th century. But as I, uh, start, as I was uh, starting my research and as I, as I was starting to write the book, I realized that there's also uh, an, an extremely personal reason for writing this book. And I think that uh, the reason is that I come from a family, uh, most of them are Holocaust survivors. You know, my father, uh, sorry, my grandfather, is an Auschwitz survival. 
and, uh, and growing up as a child with such a family, I used to hear all kinds of stories about, uh, about the war and the horrors and the Holocaust and what happened in the camps. You know, I also had uh, uh, relatives who didn't want to speak with me about it, you know, who kept it silent. And, and even one family member uh, who we, we knew that if we will only mention uh, the word Poland or Germany or something like that, there could be like a real drama in the family. So I had this entire range of relatives. Some of them, you know, I was six years old. I remember sitting on their laps and they're telling me about the Holocaust. Okay, so I had this extremity and on the other, uh, on the other hand, I had relatives who didn't want to speak about it at all. But nevertheless, as I grew up, I also saw that many of them uh, miss their childhood in Europe because they came to Israel uh, in their 40s or 50s. Uh, Israel is a rough place when you come from Europe. It's very hot. The culture is crazy. And uh, I think that they weren't be able to become real Israelis. They weren't be able to be a part of the culture. Uh, some of them didn't even acquire the Hebrew language. I remember that it was very hard to speak with my grandfather because he knew very little uh, Hebrew words and uh, our entire communication was with face expression and uh, emotional expression and stuff like that. But I wasn't really able to speak with them. And I really, as I grew up, I saw that they miss their childhood in Hungary and in the Czech Republic and Romania. And this tension between the horrible Europe, Eastern Europe, that did all these things on the one hand. And on the other hand, the stories that they told about their childhood uh, I began to think about the fact that I don't know about Jewish life. I don't know anything about Jewish life besides what they taught me at school. And what they taught me at school was basically the biblical period, okay, like 2000 or 2500 years ago. And then they said that uh, the Jewish people suffered a lot in, you know, in exile and in uh, Europe, and they spoke a lot about anti-Semitism and about the programs. And then came the uh, state of Israel as an act of redemption of what happened to uh, Jewish people in, uh, in Europe uh, or in any other place. But they don't teach us uh, about the gap between the Bible and the, Israel, uh, the Israeli state. And to be honest, most of the Jewish life it were in these 2,500 years. And I realized that I don't know anything about Jewish life at the 19th century, at the beginning of the 20th century. I don't know anything about my ancestor, how they lived, what was it like in the shtetls? Was it like, because I imagined that every day there was a program, pogrom, sorry, a, a riot, okay? But it doesn't make sense because they lived there for hundreds of years. So how was that? What was the relation with the neighbors, with the goyim, as, as we called it? Were their friends? Were their enemies? Uh, did they have any relationships besides, uh, you know, buying and selling? So I decided that I'm going uh, to do a lot of research. And uh, the book was a, a great opportunity uh, to do that. So when I... Uh, uh, think now in retrospective about uh, the reasons for writing the book, I think that I did that basically because I felt like I owe my family the memory of what was it like, you know, setting the Holocaust aside. Because in Israel, uh, uh, we don't talk a lot about this stuff. We try to create an Israeli identity, which is kind of detached from our identity in Europe or in North Africa or from any other part of the world that we came from. 
So we wanted to create like, you know, the, the melting pot of an Israeli, but part, a big part of me, of my identity, uh, comes from a different part of the world. And I really wanted to uh, address that in the book. And I really felt like there's a whole lost world that is coming to life. And uh, I wanted to bring this world to, to current uh, Israeli people. I didn't know back then that the, the book is going to be published in many languages, but I just wanted to bring uh, this lost world to, uh, to current Israelis and to tell them, look, you know, we, we forgot about our culture, we forgot about our origins. So, uh, so it was a major part, a major reason for uh, writing the book. So this was the beginning. So I, I made this decision and then uh, I realized that uh, uh, I need a protagonist. And uh, my uh, uh, main concern was I wanted the protagonist to be a woman because most of the men at that time uh, weren't very troubled by the fact that husbands lost their wife, you know? It played for their favor because they could do it as well. So it's not, it was not a, a real issue, but a lot of women suffered from this problem. By the way, I don't know if you know it, but uh, Shai Agnon, you know, the Nobel Prize writer, his original name was Shai Chachkes, and he changed his name to Agnon because in Hebrew, the word for such a woman uh, whose husband uh, left her is Aguna. So he changed his name to Agnon just to remind uh, you know, the community, the Jewish community, that such a problem truly exists and it bothers a lot of women uh, in our society. So I really wanted the protagonist to be a woman. And then I started to do some research and I realized that, uh, you know, for a Jewish woman to do such a journey alone from Motul to Minsk, it's very dangerous. So I had to give her some power. I have to give her, give her some skill. So back then women, you know, didn't serve in the army. Uh, and then came the idea of uh, a slaughterman. And then I asked myself, does Jewish women, uh, or are there any Jewish women in our tradition that had the profession of a slaughterman? And it was very hard to find, but I, find, I found two women in the 14th and the 15th century that actually were the slaughter women of their society. And apparently the Jewish tradition doesn't forbid women to be slaughter women. They don't recommend it for women, but they don't forbid it. So for me, it was enough. I decided that uh, her skill uh, is going to be the knife. She's going to be the daughter of uh, slaughterman. And, uh, and, and, and it was a, a good solution for me because um, I think that something in the Jewish tradition uh, and the act of, uh, of slaughter is very interesting. You know, we have very strict rules for that. You can't just slaughter the animal. You need to do it in a particular way. And for me as a vegetarian, it was very hard uh, to do research about, you know, such an issue. I had to watch a lot of video of uh, animal slaughter. I have to, uh, you know, study how uh, the Jewish tradition is very particular, you know, on uh, how to hold a knife and, how, and where to cut and how to cut and how deep. So it was very hard for me, uh, I must admit, but uh, in order to understand my character, I uh, needed to do that. And then came the idea that uh, she would also become a vegetarian. As a child, she was a slaughter, man, a slaughter woman, but uh, she finally realized that uh, she should respect animals, but she always kept the knife. And then I realized that if she is going to slaughter human beings, then she should do it according to the Jewish tradition. And, and for me, I think, I, I don't know where exactly it happens in the book, I think maybe in page uh, 60, 50, but when I made this connection, I, I felt like I really know this woman. I really know the protagonist. 
she's not only a slaughter woman, she is uh, particular about how she slaughters her enemies or, uh, and then came the idea of uh, Fanny Kaisman, the protagonist of the book. And then I needed to uh, realize who is going to accompany her in her journey because she can't do the, the journey all by herself and I needed some you know, people she could speak with, people who will help her. And I made the decision that the people who will join her will be from the outskirts of the Jewish society. They will not be from the mainstream of the society. They will not be the rabbi or the leaders or the rich people. They are going to be Jewish people who were kind of uh, banned from society or removed from society, either by choice or uh, they were forced to do that. And then I came to this amazing story about, uh, that is called, I don't know if you know it, uh, but it, for me it was fascinating because I didn't know that such a, uh, uh, such a tremendous uh, events occurred in the 19th century the story of the Cantonist. The Cantonist are Jewish people, actually Jewish children, who were forcefully recruited to the Russian army at the age of eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. You know, people came to their houses, they burst in, they took them from their beds, they uh, pushed them into a wagon and they just took them to a military camp. And since then, from, for 20 or 30 years, these Jewish children became Russian uh, soldiers. And uh, this was actually uh, the idea of the Tsar Nikolai I, who is called the Iron Tsar. And Nikolai I decided that it's absolutely necessary to do that with the Jewish people because this is the only way that we can incorporate them into the Russian society, okay? Nikolai I sent a lot of officials uh, uh, to check out the Jewish people in Russia. And these officials came back and they told him, look, you know what, the Jewish people in Russia there are only approximately 15% of the population. And by the way, we have documents. When I did my research, I saw the actual documents that these officials came uh, to, the first, uh, to Nikolai I and showed him their findings. So uh, they told him the Jewish population is approximately 15% uh, of the entire population, but they feel like there are 85% of the population. Whatever you want to do, you want to buy something, you find out that the seller is a, is a, is a Jew. You want to take a trip somewhere, you find out that the wagon man is a Jew. You want to drink something, you want to go to a, to a, a pub or an inn, you find out that the owner is a Jew, okay? And there are only 15% of the population. And Nikolai, Nikolai uh, the first uh, uh, said, well, this is very interesting. I see that they are very important to our economy, but they are not real Russians because I see them selling uh, uh, wheat and grains to Russians and to the Turkish, who are our enemies. And I see them going all through Europe and uh, where is their loyalty? So we need to make them Russians. So Nicholas I decided that the way to do that is to take ch three children on every thousand people in the Jewish population. And uh, he gave the Jewish community the choice to choose who are the children who are gonna go to the Russian army. And guess who the Jewish community chose? They didn't, chose, they didn't choose the rich ones. They didn't choose the sons, and, uh, the sons of the rabbi. They chose the poor, the orphans, and those who couldn't protect themselves, those who couldn't buy themselves out, those who couldn't marry at a young age and by that, uh, you know, avoid this burden, uh, and so became the Cantonists. 
And I decided that the first man who is going to join Fanny is, a, is an army veteran called Zizek, a cantonist, who was recruited by the age of uh, eight to the Russian army. And he will be the one who helps her in a journey. He will provide the horses, the wagon. So this was my first idea. And along the way, she acquired a few more friends like Dorothy from, you know, the Wizard of Oz. She acquires more and more friends. All of them are Jewish, but from the outskirts of uh, society. And I want to say something about uh, the research of the book because it was very complicated. The research was, uh, it took me, I think maybe five or six years to write the book. And I think that maybe three or four years, if you do like a calculation, uh, three or four years w w was just about, you know, reading books and, and searching for documents. And it was very difficult because uh, most books in history, are about the big issues in life, okay? I, I, I can give you an example. Part of the book takes place in the Crimean War, okay? It depicts a major events in the Crimean War. Now, if you Google the Crimean War, you will get hundreds of books, but 99% of these books are about generals, moving forces from here to there, and the mistakes they did, and, uh, you know, uh, and the economy, how it affected the economy and stuff like that. But I was searching for the lives of the uh, simple soldiers in the trenches. And, and books in history mostly are not about that. So it was very hard throughout the book. It was very hard to uh, discover the small details of Jewish life in the shtetls and about the Russian soldier in the trenches. And uh, I really had to dig, and some of the books were in Russian, so I needed to translate them to English or to Hebrew. Luckily, I was in uh, Columbia University back then and the resources, resources were uh, immense, but it took a lot of time just to find the right resources. And I can tell you, Another interesting story about that, uh, I, I, I had a, a feeling that uh, I shouldn't go to Belarus. The, the book takes place in Belarus. Back then it was the Russian Empire, but now it's Belarus. I had the feeling that I don't, uh, don't want to go to Belarus before I write the book because I felt that if I'll go to Belarus, it will completely ruin my imagination. Because right now, Belarus is, you know, the 21st century. It doesn't look like the 19th century. So I will just ruin the whole, uh, uh, the whole, uh, my whole uh, uh, motivation for trying to imagine how things were. But after I finished writing the book, I made a decision that it's a bit irresponsible to publish the book without checking some facts in Belarus. So I decided to go to Belarus, but after I wrote the book and before I started, you know, to edit and uh, to do all the final adjustments before publishing it. And when I reached Bel Belarus, I went to the small town of Motol. The book starts from the small town of Motol. By the way, I chose the city uh, for many reasons, but one of the reasons is that the first president of Israel, Chaim Weizmann, was born in that city, in uh, Motul. Actually, you can't really call it a city. It's like a town or a shtetl or even a village. I don't know uh, the right uh, word, but it's, it's not a city as you can imagine a city. So I went to uh, Motul and uh, I asked my translator, let's try to find some older people to share with us memories about uh, their Jewish neighbors before the war. And every time we met such a people, we, we even met a, a, a woman at the age of 102, okay? So it's not, she, she wasn't born in the 19th century, but it's not that far. And every time we asked them about Jewish life, their first immediate reaction was to tell us about the events of uh, World War II, about the Holocaust. 
about the day that the Nazis show up, how they took their neighbors, how sorry they were, and blah, 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 blah. But, you know, it, it took us a while for them to realize that we are actually interested in something completely different. We are interested about the small details of Jewish life in Europe before the war. And when they realized that, they started to tell us amazing stories, which I used on the book. For example, they told us that they always felt that, uh, uh, that the priest, the Christian priest, was not as smart as the rabbi, as the Jewish rabbi. So when they had like a major issue, a major problem, they secret, secretly went to meet the, the local rabbi and avoided uh, the priest. So this is just one example. Another example, it, they told us that the most popular band in Christian uh, uh, weddings were, was the Clay Zemmels, the Jewish band. So they had a Christian wedding and uh, the Jewish band played in the Christian wedding and, 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 and a whole lot of stories about uh, their life together. So, uh, so the research was extremely complicated because I needed to find the small details and it was very hard to dig them from uh, you know, the big books of history and, and the major issues that most people are uh, concerned, concerned uh, uh, you know, when you speak about the major events. And another thing I want to tell uh, about the book is, uh, I want to uh, tell you a bit about uh, the Russian character, the investigator. His name is Pyotr Novak, and he's a, a Russian army man, army veteran. He was injured in the war, and he was recruited to the secret police, what we call the Okhrana. And the Okhrana is, uh, you know, uh, today we would call it the KGB, the NKVD, the, I don't know, but back then it was called the Okhrana. And the Okhrana had a, a entirely, um, you know, manipulative, uh, uh, they, they, they recruited agents and informants and they paid a lot of people to, uh, to tell them whatever they wanted to do. And, and he was, he was a, a proud army man. And then he was recruited to the secret police. And he gets these weird investigations. He sees a trail of bodies. They are cut in their throat like the Jewish slaughtermen usually do. And now he needs to uh, realize what's going on in his empire, you know, what's going on in the region, who is the murderer, what is he after, and stuff like that. And for me, this character was extremely important. Uh, I love him no less than I love Fanny, and I'll explain why. Because, uh, as I said, I was much influenced by the Russian literature, the Russian greats, and the Yiddish greats. And one of the most uh, evident things in the writing of the Russian greats and the Yiddish greats is they, they do a tremendous, a tremendous job to describe their own community. But when Tolstoy or Dostoevsky or Turgenev or whatever, when they have a Jewish character in the books, it doesn't come out very well. Usually there's a lot of stereotypes it's not a real character. Um, it's a bit anti-Semitic, especially with Dostoevsky, but not only. And by the way, with the Yiddish writers as well, when they depict a, a Christian character, a Goy, it's also filled with a lot of stereotypes. And uh, so it was important for me to fix that. The book is called in Hebrew, Tikkun, and I will, uh, probably say more about the name of the book, but it was important to me to have a book that uh, contains not only a, a round Jewish characters, but also a Russian character, a deep character, a complicated person, 
And, and the thing is that Novak starts by being a, a, a common anti-Semitic Russian. And back then, by the way, it wasn't that rare. It was actually quite common. You know, uh, most Russians, Polish, were in this sense or another a bit anti-Semitic. But Novak, in order to crack the case, he needs to get to know the Jewish community. And there are parts in the book that he has to really uh, take a, a, a Jewish profile or a Jewish disguise in order to uh, advance his inquiries. And I think that it's very important uh, to experience this while reading the book. I mean, the, the exchange of identities. The, I, I think this is the great, uh, uh, the great joy and the happiness that we can get uh, in literature. The fact that we can imagine a completely different person from a completely different culture, but we don't want to do it from the outside, you know, from, a, uh, from, an, from an external point of view. Literature gives us the possibility to kind of go into that identity and to actually wear it and to feel how it's like. And I think that Novak uh, discovers a lot of interesting things about Jewish life. And we, as Jewish people, discover a lot of interesting things about Russian life. Because I don't know if you know it, but uh, I can give you an example. In Israel, we have a very big Orthodox community, okay? Uh, you know, the ones who wear the, the stremels and, uh, and they live in certain neighborhoods in Israel, in Nebrak and Jerusalem. And uh, there's a huge debate in Israel about uh, the Orthodox community and the army because they don't serve in the army. And because they don't serve in the army, and since the army is so important in Israel and is common to so many sections of uh, the Israeli society, they kind of stay out of society. So one of the things that many people in Israel say is that we have to recruit them. And if they refuse, we have to force them. And this is exactly what Nikolai I said in the 19th century about the Jewish people. Uh, we have to recruit them, otherwise they wouldn't be a, a part of Russian society. So this was a, a huge amazement for me. I was astonished to discover how much the issues in the 19th century echo our current time, our current major problems in Israel right now are echoed, are echoed in this book. And by the way, I didn't plan it. It just happened. As much as I uh, kept on doing the research, I discovered that the very same problems that existed back then exist right now in Israel society. But right now, the Jewish people in Israel are the majority, are what we call, you know, we have our own government, but we're doing the same to another community within us. So when I realized that, I, I kind of uh, uh, realized that uh, I don't know whether the book is only about the 19th century. Okay, there's a question about it. And um, I want to leave uh, some time for questions, but uh, I would just say uh, two things. Uh, first, I'll go back to my trip in Belarus. What amazed me in Belarus, where, where, when I reached the town of Model, you know, I told you that I, w I didn't want to go before writing the book because I, I was afraid that I would discover something completely different. I was amazed to see how Model in 21st century remained a small town in the 19th century. Okay, it was, it was completely shocking for me. I remember driving in the main road, so we saw a few houses, and then I, I told my translator that I want to start uh, walking and following the trail of my protagonists. So we started walking near the Aselda River, 
okay? And then I saw houses, no electricity, toilet in uh, the backyard, the house was just one or one and a half rooms, and I saw a lot of uh, people doing their laundry in the river, and I was amazed to see how the town didn't change from the 19th century. And when we spoke to the people there, one of the, uh, one of the ladies, uh, she was, I think, 95 years old or something that, like that. She told me something that really made me think about Jewish life back then. She told me that uh, the main thing that she remembers from, from the Jewish people is their activity, is how they always took the place uh, uh, forward. They always came out with new ventures and new ideas, and they always uh, you know, used their skills, even though they were not the majority. And she told me a sentence that I, I cannot forget. She told me, you see this place? Since uh, they took the Jewish here from in 1942 or 1943, this place is dead. And I really felt that. I really felt that in many of uh, the towns that I visited, it was really amazing to see how, how they remained back then in the 19th century. It was a real astonishment for me. Uh, and uh, another thing I wanted to uh, tell you about is the name of the book. The name of the book in Hebrew is uh, Tikkun Achar Chatzot. Uh, in English, it will be Tikkun After Midnight. So the name Tikkun or the term Tikkun is very important in the Jewish tradition. Uh, originally, the name Tikkun in Hebrew is like a garment. The bride wears a garment before her wedding, so the word tikkun stands for a garment, something that we, uh, you know, we wear, we want to make ourselves more pretty, we want to be uh, at our best. But uh, the Jewish tradition took this term from an aesthetic point of view also to a moral or psychological point of view. So the term tikkun also refers to our uh, possibility or our desire to be better people, to amend ourselves, to, uh, uh, to correct ourselves, okay? And uh, I call this book Tikkun After Midnight because I think that one of the major questions of the book is whether the characters were really able to do Tikkun, to do amendment, to correct themselves. Uh, so it's a question whether Fanny was able to correct her sister uh, Faith, whether Zizek, who was, recruiter, who was recruited at the age of eight to the Russian army, uh, will he be able to change, you know, at a very, uh, being an adult he's in his 50s, after his whole life were ruined in the Russian army, would he be able to have some comfort in the last years of his life? And Novak, who was once a proud army man, and now he's, a, he's like a police rat. He uses all the time lies and manipulations. Would he be able to find a, a, a place that he could actually feel more human being and less... A rat. So, and also for the Jewish people in general, because uh, uh, when I wrote the book, it's, it's a strange thing to write a, a historical novel because I know what happened to all these people 50 years later. We all know what happened to Fanny and her family if they stayed in Belarus. We all know what happened to them 50 years later. So, it's kind of weird to write a, a historical novel when you already know the, the end. But I, 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 I remained in the 19th century, and it's not a coincidence. I remained in the 19th century because I invite Jewish people, and not only Jewish people, I invite, I invite human beings in general to see how 
the the biggest tragedies in li- tragedies in life how the the you know the the most uh, horrible horrors they have their origins you know at a much earlier stage when you can start to sense it but you know you tell yourself all kinds of stories and you give yourself all kinds of justifications and you say look it's going to be okay and things are going to get better and uh, but actually it's not always like that so there's a big question about tikkun for the jewish people in in, in general in this book so uh first of all thank you for listening and i, I want to leave some time for questions so i'll give thank uh, you the, uh, the thank you very much and this is fascinating i'm reminding all our listeners that you can send the questions that you have in the q and a we have some questions and the first one is a question about the yiddish language uh, you choose many words in yiddish that are not necessarily translated in the book uh when you know that most of the people don't speak jewish as they call the yiddish language words like shidduch and pil pilpul wilde chayes the nickname for fanny golem golus zeleger love the name for the dog mikhaye goishi so what what was the reason that you chose to include these words without the translation i mean i loved it but you need to know the meaning <laughs> Yeah, I know. I, I had a huge argument with, uh, with my editors. Uh, you know, they, they wanted to switch to English maybe, or they wanted to do a footnote, you know, explaining the word or stuff like that. And, and I kind of insisted uh, to, to leave the Yiddish words. There are not a lot of them, but there are some of them to leave them. Uh, well, there are two reasons. Uh, first, I'm, I'm a, a huge fan of music in writing. I, I feel that as a writer, music for me is very important. The tempo of the sentence, the look and feel, how you can hear it, how you can pronounce it. So uh, I thought that the Yiddish words, every once in a while, They give the book a, 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 an interesting flavor. And, and one of my favorite Hebrew writers, uh, I'm sure you all know him, uh, Itzhak Bashevi Zingel. He said something really interesting about Yiddish. And, 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 and he said that there's something about the English language that it's not a language of victory. It's not a language that you can use, okay? Uh, imagine that you have a Jewish uh, army division and they storm the mountain with, uh, with Yiddish, you know? Uh, you can't imagine that. There's something in the music of Yiddish that I really like. It's very soft. It has a lot of humor. It's very light. And I think that uh, I wanted... Uh, to, to uh, let our readers feel that. Uh, because in Israel, we kind of lost that, you know? Uh, Israel made us, I mean, the Jewish people who came up to Israel, they made us very tough, very rough. You know, the Hebrew language, you can storm a mountain with the Hebrew language, which is very similar to... You know to the biblical language to arabic language and 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 the language of, of the region but you can't do it with the uh, with the yiddish language and i don't know if you know it but in israel in the 50s it was forbidden for people to talk yiddish on the streets okay if you walked out on uh, uh, in the 50s talking yiddish a policeman could give you a fine So uh, I really wanted to bring the Yiddish language back to Israel and back to England and back to Canada and back to the United States and Italy and, and France. And I wanted people to recognize that the Jewish people had a great language and they could use it uh, for their survival, for the day-to-day life. It was filled with humor, it was filled with acceptance uh, to their destiny, and it didn't have, it wasn't a rough Hebrew, uh, you know, strict language. So it was actually important for me. 
Well, you mentioned the word humor. There is a lot yeah. of humor in the book. And I'm okay. wondering, what is the role of humor in your life? When, when does one decide to keep serious and when to let go? It's a great question. Um, I think that my writing changed uh, eight years ago because I became a father. And uh, for eight years, I uh, haven't slept as a human being because I had three daughters in eight years. And uh, every night I get up three, four times. And uh, so my taste in reading changed because before that I could read heavy novels and serious novels and I could read uh, Zivald and Proust and I could uh, take War and Peace and, uh, you know, and, and, and since uh, I became a much more uh, tired person, uh, my taste in reading changed. I need more uh, vivid books with uh, lots of humor and with things that are really happening. I need plot. I need a plot in the book. And it's not like that. And Hebrew literature, I don't know if you know a lot of Hebrew literature, but since we live in a, a very complicated place with lots of problems and lots of issues, then sometimes our literature uh, becomes like the place we live in. It becomes heavy, it becomes too serious in my opinion, uh, and it's tiresome for the readers. You don't want to read a newspaper when you read a book. You want to read a book, you want to be observed in the characters, in the plot, and, and since then, since eight years ago, for me, humor is absolutely crucial in almost every uh, piece of writing that I uh, produce. Wow. So how much, Yaniv, is your background as a, in philosophy? How much did it influence your career as a novelist? Or do you think of them as very two distinct disciplines? Uh -huh. um, well, my... my uh, field of research is the philosophy of language. So uh, on the one hand, they are interrelated. Writing and the philosophy of language are interrelated because a lot of writers think that uh, the raw material of uh, the writer is the plot or the character or the story. But you can have amazing stories uh, uh, that are you know, present in awful books. And you have great books with no stories. So I think that the raw material of the writer is the language, you know, the, like, like the, carpenter, the, the carpenter has wood, we have words, okay? So uh, as much as you understand more about language and how it works and the different angles that you can uh, achieve with, uh, with a deeper understanding of language, then you gain more skills as a writer. So in this sense, it was very important for me. And, and by the way, in the book, one of the most uh, hard things was to find the correct language of the book because I didn't want to write like Shalom Aleichem because then I would immediately fail. Nobody can write like Shalom Aleichem. And I didn't want to write in contemporary language because I wanted to kind of uh, uh, bring forth the, the flavor of 19th century. So it was very, very hard. And it took me a while to find the correct, uh, uh, the correct tempo, the correct phrasing. And by the way, when I go to army scenes, the language becomes a bit more shallow. And when I go to the shtetls, uh, then the language becomes more in the Yiddish flavor. And when I describe Novak, then I'm influenced more by the, the, the Russian writers. But in the end, I had to find a, a certain mixture of all these influences and create something new. On the other hand, uh, academic writer, uh, writing is the exact opposite of uh, literature you know, uh, academic uh, essays. And uh, so I'm glad I'm able more to focus now on writing yeah. and uh, not on uh, academic research. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. 
So two, we'll take uh, two more questions before we conclude. Uh, I want to take you back to uh, Piotr Novak, who you mentioned earlier was one of your favorite characters in the book. It seems that uh, despite the fact that he's an officer in the, under, in the secret police and involved in lies and manipulations, he's also very conscientious. I actually want to read a sentence uh, from the book which says, over time, Novak has come to realize that his work requires the exact opposite of courage and dignity. The only justification for performing his despicable duties is to exercise the power vested in him by the Russian Empire. What inspired this idea of character with conscious? There is a very interesting element here of very strong with him. And what's yes. the connection? Yes, yes, I agree. Well, uh, you found uh, an extremely delicate uh, point because uh, for me at least, Novak is uh, the one that is most related to my bi biography. Uh, so uh, what you read now, I actually experienced myself because uh, growing up, I grew up in, in, you know, in Rishon Lezion. I don't know if you know this city, but it's nearby Tel Aviv. It's 20 minutes from Tel Aviv, but it's a, it's a suburban city. And, and growing up there uh, in the mainstream of Israeli society, I, I recruited the army at the age of 18, feeling that I'm going to save my country and I'm going to be a, I, I volunteered to an elite unit and I was highly motivated and I went through some real deep uh, training to achieve that. And, and I remember the days that I was first uh, uh, went into, you know, operations in uh, the occupied territories. And I remember my shock at the things that I had to do. And I was like, well, wait, wait a second. This is the hero that they promised me, okay? They promised me you know, to be a, a Rambo. And now I feel like I'm going into houses and I'm waking up the, the children. And, and the two kind of the fantasy and the reality were, were, were two, uh, were so different, were so uh, distinct, like the two opposites of what I imagined. And I think that Novak is uh, experienced experiencing that as well. Uh, so this is why I, I said that while writing the book, I felt like uh, the 19th century issues are really echoed in our society right now. Yes, indeed, indeed. So before we say goodbye, what is your next project? I mean, are you, after such long and process of writing this magnificent book, are you going to take a few years off? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna surprise you. Just by accident, I didn't prepare it uh, uh, in advance, but you see this? Yes. This is my new book in Israel. I can't it read it. It came out uh, three days ago in Israel. Oh, as we say, Mazal Tov. Todaraba. Uh, it's called uh, Nobody Leaves uh, Palo Alto, and it's going to be translated to English soon. But uh, so I already wrote a new novel, you know, uh, and my next project, I think I'm going to take a few months and, uh, and rest, but uh, I have, uh, I want to I go back uh, to Europe, I think, to Jewish life in Europe, basically. Wow. So I can't wait to, uh, to read the book whenever we could Thank get uh, go to visit and, and purchase it, or we'll wait until it's published in English. But uh, this was fantastic, Yaniv. I can't thank you enough. I recommend all those who have not read the book to do it. I feel that not only that the, the plot is interesting, I've learned a lot, and I'm waiting for the movie. Uh, I hope that it will become a coming movie. Coming soon, coming soon. Yes, exactly. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for your participation. Thank you, thank Thank you, and everyone, and thanks a lot for hosting me. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye.